Hi. Um, Hi. It's my pleasure to welcome you to today's event hosted by the Powering Past Coal Alliance uh, in partnership with the Danish and Ethiopian UN missions, the co-chairs of the Energy Transition Coalition. I'm Antha Williams. I'm the global head of the climate and environmental programs at Bloomberg Philanthropies. And um, I'm excited to be chairing today's event. Um, at Bloomberg Philanthropies, we really believe in a future free from coal and one that will avoid the dangerous impacts of climate change and protect our health and communities. Um, my boss is Mike Bloomberg, the founder of Bloomberg Philanthropies and Bloomberg LP, and he really believes in the power of forward thinking governments in leading climate action efforts. And we've seen firsthand the power of collaboration and exchange among governments and businesses and communities as they embark on their journey moving away from coal. We're a strong supporter of the Powering Past Coal Alliance, and since its launch at COP23 in 2017 by the UK and Canadian governments, this alliance has played a really important role in bringing together like-minded national and subnational governments, businesses, financial institutions, and organizations to reduce the world's reliance on coal power and drive coal phase out efforts globally. This alliance has really emerged as a leading force in driving the transition to a clean energy future. And the leadership of this alliance is more critical now than ever. Um, of course, the COVID-19 pandemic has created enormous challenges for our societies and economies on so many levels, but we really can't allow it to derail climate progress and slow down the expansion of our clean energy resources. Our role as climate leaders is to ensure that recovery efforts are employed as a mechanism to step up our climate efforts and accelerate the transition away from coal and toward a clean and sustainable energy system. And we're really at a critical juncture right now. Um, this moment gives us ex an extraordinary opportunity to deliver a green recovery and build a stronger and more resilient world. I wanna make a brief note um, before we get started. Um, in the top right corner, you will see an option to select language interpretation. And you can choose to be tuned into the English or the Korean channel. And then when you select the preferred channel, you need to click done. Um, so with that, um, we will uh, transition to our, our opening remarks. We'll be hearing from distinguished speakers and Powering Past Coal Alliance members that represent both the national and the subnational governments and utilities on how they're supporting and accelerating the clean energy transition through their policies and their investments. So now it's my pleasure to welcome Minister Jonathan Wilkinson, Canada's Minister of Environment and Climate Change and a co-chair of the Powering Past Coal Alliance to share a few words and exciting announcements about the Alliance. Hello everyone. Bonjour à tous. Je vous remercie de m'avoir invité ici aujourd'hui. As Canada's Minister of Environment and Climate Change, it is an honor to participate today in my role as co-chair of the Powering Past Coal Alliance. I want to thank my colleagues from Denmark and Ethiopia who are bringing us together today to discuss the critical importance of a global phase out of emissions from coal power. We are living through extraordinary times. The COVID-19 pandemic has created tremendous loss and uncertainty around the world. But among the hardships and challenges, I also see a silver lining. The pandemic has reminded us of what we can accomplish when we all work together toward a common goal. This is a lesson I hope we can apply to the fight against climate change. The pandemic has created an opportunity, an opportunity to build back better. That means creating an economy and a society that is stronger, more sustainable, and more resilient than before. Canada is very fully committed to our goal of exceeding our Paris Agreement target of reducing greenhouse gas emissions by more than 30% below 2005 levels by 2030. We are also committed to achieving net zero emissions by 2050, as the science tells us we must. Certainly a key element of Canada's climate plan is the phase out of coal. We know that the phase out of emissions from coal fired electricity is an essential step in meeting Canada's emissions targets and for the world 
to significantly and rapidly reduce emissions. Emissions from coal power plants represent fully a fifth of global greenhouse gas emissions. That is why Canada and the United Kingdom co-founded the Powering Past Coal Alliance nearly three years ago. Since then, we have been joined by over 100 national and subnational governments, businesses and organizations, all united in accelerating the transition away from traditional coal power. And we are here today because the PPCA is the driving force behind Secretary General Gutierrez's call for no new coal power and an end to coal, uh, coal finance. The strength of our alliance is its diversity. And today, I am very pleased to announce seven new members. The Government of Peru, the Alliance's first member from South America. Two jurisdictions in South Korea, the city of Seoul and Gyeonggi province. Joined by South Chungcheong, the Alliance's existing Korean subnational member, these three governments represent half the population of South Korea. I am also pleased to announce Kaohsiung City and Taichung City, also the state of Baden-Württemberg, and EDP, a Portuguese multinational utility with operations across the full electricity value chain in 19 countries around the world. Congratulations to all of you and thank you for joining us. A number of these members come from regions where coal continues to play a significant role, where ample financing for traditional coal still exists. Together, we must find constructive solutions to end emissions from coal, while ensuring a sustainable transition for workers and for communities. I look forward very much to the work ahead, but I will say it will be no easy task. Only by working together can we create a greener, more prosperous future for our children and our grandchildren. Thank you very much for joining today. Merci beaucoup. Thank you so much, Minister um, Wilkinson. The diversity and breadth of the Powering Past Coal Alliance is really um, striking and the momentum is building as more governments and businesses move faster than expected to transition away from coal. It's now my pleasure to welcome Minister Svenja Schultz, Germany's Federal Minister for the Environment, Nature Conservation and Nuclear Safety. Germany joined the Powering Past Coal Alliance last year at the 2019 UN Climate Action Summit. Minister Schultz, thank you for joining us. I think we may be having a challenge hearing Minister Schultz, so we will come back to her. Oh, no. oh do you hear me now? It's now better now. Thank you. Uh, so there were some technical problems uh, of different codes to get in. So I'm happy to, to join you now. Uh, colleagues, ladies and gentlemen, it's about one year ago, I think one year ago at the Climate uh, Action Summit, I had the honor of announcing uh, that Germany has joined the, the Powering Pulse Coal Alliance. Regrettably, the, the challenge we have faced not we see that since then, COVID-19 has called into question many things that we used to take for granted. And at, at the same time, there's growing urgency to the fight against climate change. So nevertheless, we can draw courage from the situation. And I would like to give you three short examples. But the firstly is more and more countries are recognizing that coal is a, a road to nowhere and that renewable energy strengthen the national economy and the national public health and the energy security. Um, at the same time, governments are committed a great deal of money to tackling the uh, economic impacts of COVID-19 and in doing so are accelerating the transition to a future without fossil fuels. And secondly, a growing number of business are acknowledging that they also need to change course. And as we have just heard, in contrast to solar and wind facilities, almost half of the world's coal-fired power plants are no longer economically viable. And the third is our alliance is expanding 
Peru has just joined, becoming the first South American country to do so. And I would uh, also like to welcome our colleagues from Korea. It is also very pleasing that more and more subnational uh, administration relations are uh, signing up to PPCA as well. And all these efforts need robust support from national government and they need financial, financial backing too. And that is why in the new initiative, Germany and others support projects in countries which are updating their NDC to reflect more ambitious climate targets. And in Germany, we brought all stakeholders to the table and, and jointly agree on the face out of coal in the spirit of, of a just, of a fair transition. And we are in the middle of phasing out coal fired power, power generations. The first hard coal power plants are being decommissioned uh, this year. And at the same time, we are supporting those regions where up to now coal has been uh, an economic asset, providing them with, with massive funding to create new uh, climate friendly jobs. And just transition will gain an importance at the European level too. All the more so if we significantly raise the EU climate target for 2030. And I'm advocating this pass also in my current role uh, as the chair of the EU Environmental Council. So thank you very much. I think it is very important that we have this past power, past power and coal alliance. Thank you so much for your comments, um, Minister. Those are, are very well taken. And I'd like to now welcome to the virtual stage, the Zoom stage, Vice Minister Gabriel Quijandria, the Vice Minister of Strategic Development of Natural Resources in Peru. We're really delighted to welcome Peru as a member of the Powering Past Coal Alliance today. Uh, as the minister has said, the first country in South America to join the alliance, very significant. And they'll be a really critical pow um, power and partner uh, in advancing this agenda. Over to you, Vice Minister. Thank you. Thank you, Anta. Um, First of all, let me thank uh, Ministers Wilkinson and Schultz for their welcoming words. We hope to, to achieve uh, as expected. Dear Ministers, distinguished authorities, ladies and gentlemen, COVID-19 marks a before and after for humanity. However, climate change continues to be the greatest challenge we face. In this context, climate action represents an opportunity to mainstream sustainability in the process of economic recovery consistent with the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development, accelerating global transition towards a clean, sustainable, and inclusive energy future is everyone's task, not only because of its relation to reducing greenhouse gases emissions, but also due to the impact it has on our citizens' welfare and health. Peru is approaching its bicentennial with ambitious commitments to become an active player in the climate action agenda, taking firm steps to tackle climate change. Please let me now share our progress today. First, at the end of 2018, the NDC multi-sector working group composed of 13 ministries and the National Center for Strategic Planning approved its final report identifying 62 mitigation measures and 1991 adaptation measures in the areas of water, agriculture, forests, health, fisheries, and aquaculture which has, are targeted in our NDCs. Of these 62 mitigation measures, 18 are focused in promoting renewable energy, energy efficiency, and sustainable transport. To strengthen the national commitment in response to climate change and allow for NDC measures to be implemented, we have established a high-level commission on climate change, a permanent body of ministers, and with representation from regional and local governments, we will be the main space to discuss and design our path forward to an increased climate ambition. Second, during 2020 and 2021, Peru will focus on the implementation of the climate law and its by law. Key pieces to incorporate and promote climate action with the direct involvement of stakeholders of public and private sector, as well as with civil society and indigenous peoples, organizations, and academia. We have been gradually developing its 22 guidelines and an action plan on climate mitigation. 
which will strengthen climate institutions as well as the design, implementation, monitoring, and reporting of our NDCs. And here I would like to highlight the efforts that our energy sector has made in empowering women in rural sectors, developing their capacities in the use, management, and sustainability of clean technologies through the pilot project Energy School for Women, or eWomen. Third, this year we will submit our enhanced NDC with greater ambition, transparency, and sense of urgency, both in adaptation and mitigation. Fourth, we have begun to process up or of updating our national climate change strategy with a long-term vision to decarbonation, decarbonization by 2050. Peru's technical proposal for carbon neutrality by 2050 and Peru's national adaptation plan are the building blocks of this strategy that will be launched in 2021 after a comprehensive participatory process. Preliminary results of the technical proposal estimate that the decarbonization goal will bring economic benefits bordering $98 billion by 2050 and will allow progress toward multiple development objectives, identifying institutional arrangements, and require regulations to achieve transformational change, both in the medium and long term. In this context, Peru has identified some priorities for climate resilient development, as well as to achieve decarbonization by 2050 such as the transformation of the energy matrix to renewable energy and the electrification of the economy, which will also improve air quality in cities with clear benefits to public health. Peru has a higher potential for competitiveness regarding renewable energy. We have many low cost sources, such as biomass, solar, wind, and geothermal. Although we have seen an important increase in the adoption of these technologies during the past 10 years. Most of the potential is still to be developed. The firm and permanent re reduction of the cost of technologies associated with this generation and storage of renewable energy provide greater opportunities for the private sector. And do that, we are pursuing actions to electrify the industry and the transport sectors. Fifth. The vision of the PPCA strengthens the promotion of renewable energies, which are part of our NDC, and it's aligned with the objective set in our national energy policy 2010-2040. For those reasons, last June, Peru joined the PPCA, becoming the first country in South America and the fourth in Latin America to join this initiative. In line with PPCA mandate, let me announce that Peru's only only one coal-fired plant will cease to operate in 2022, making our national electrical system coal-free and based only on natural gas and renewable energies. This decision is possible thanks to the voluntary commitment of the private sector, an important actor whose role in climate action is fundamental. Finally, Peru wishes to congratulate the PPCA, late but Canada and the United Kingdom, and Denmark and Ethiopia for organizing today's event. It is events like this that allow us to share the action we have been implementing towards a green, low carbon and climate resilient development where each small effort counts to make great changes so that no one is left behind. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Minister. Those are such important commitments and we're delighted um, to see Peru joining the, the ranks of leaders uh, in the Powering Pass Coal Alliance. Thank you so much. Your um, comments about subnational action, the business sector and subnationals is, is important and timely. Um, and with that, I'm excited to introduce Governor Yang Sung Jo, the governor of the South Chungcheong province in South Korea, who's joining us today. South Chungcheong province joined PPCA as a member in 2018 and has emerged as a pioneer of the transition away from coal in Asia. At the heart of the province's efforts is the aim of protecting the health of its 2 million residents. Welcome, Governor. The floor is yours. Yeah, 
글로벌 에너지 전환 관련 행사에 초청해 주신 것에 대해 감사드립니다. 전 세계 회원 여러분과 전 지구적 공통 의제인 지속 가능한 청정 에너지로의 전환을 통해 기업 위기로부터 지구촌을 구하기 위한 뜻깊은 자리에 함께하기 위해 매우 기쁘게 생각합니다. 이 자리를 통해 서로의 지혜와 경험을 나누고 우리 후손이 누려야 할 청정한 지구를 위해 함께 힘을 모아 나가길 기대합니다. 먼저 충청남도에 대해 소개 말씀을 드리고자 합니다. 충청남도는 대한민국 중앙에 위치한 광역지방정부입니다. 면적은 8245제곱킬로미터로 대한민국 면적의 8.2%를 차지하고 인구는 약 220만 명으로 대한민국 인구 5200만 명의 4.1%를 차지합니다. 산업과 농업이 고르게 발전하고 문화와 관광이 어우러져 산과 들, 바다가 아름다운 곳입니다. 또한 1인당 지역 내 총생산은 전국 2위 수준인 5,399만 5천 원으로 대한민국을 대표하는 철강 산업단지와 석유학단지, 디스플레이 반도체, 자동차, 생산 공장 등이 입지해 있습니다. 그런가 하면 도내 산업시설과 수도권의 전력 공급을 위해 전국 최대 규모의 석탄 화력 발전소를 포함하여 대한민국 화력 발전소 총 60기 중 50%인 30기가 소재한 곳이기도 합니다. 아시다시피 석탄 화력 발전소는 미세먼지와 함께 온실가스를 가장 많이 발생시키는 주요 시설입니다. 이로 인해 2017년 기준으로 대한민국 연간 온실가스 배출량인 7억 900만 톤 중에서 충남의 배출량은 1억 7 7 0 0만 톤으로 전국 25%에 달하며 17개 시도 중에서 가장 많은 양을 배출하고 있습니다. 더욱 중요한 것은 도내 석탄 화력발전소에서 내뿜는 온실가스 양이 9천만 톤 이상으로 전체 배출량의 절반 이상을 차지하고 있는 점이라 하겠습니다. 저는 이와 같은 석탄 화력발전소 문제를 해결하기 위해 지난 2018년 7월 취임하면서 깨끗한 공기, 맑은 충청 프로젝트를 제첫 번째 공약으로 정했습니다. 그리고 이를 도민과 함께 실천하고자 그동안 도내 300여 개 시민단체들과 힘을 모아 도내 노후 석탄 화력발전소를 폐쇄하기 위해 노력했습니다. 발전소 조기 폐쇄를 위한 논리를 만들고 국회 토론을 비롯해 여러 차례 토론을 개최하여 국민들의 관심과 이해를 높여왔습니다. 그 결과 37년 정도 된 운영에서 노화된 석탄 화력발전소인 보령화력 1억 2억기를 예정보다 2년 정도 앞당겨 조기 폐쇄는 결과를 이끌어냈습니다. 또한 중앙정부로부터 성능 개선 사업을 이유로 화력발전 수명을 10년간 더 연장시키는 계획을 중단하겠다는 약속을 받았습니다. 그러나 이런 에너지 전환 과정은 매우 복잡한 이해충돌의 과정을 거칠 수밖에 없습니다. 여러 이해관계자와 일자리가 연결되고 지역경제의 문제와도 직결되어 있기 때문입니다. 지역의 경제 충격을 줄이고 지속가능한 성장 동력을 마련하는 정의로운 에너지 존에 대한 고민은 이런 바탕에서 출발하고 있습니다. 충청남도는 올해부터 정의로운 에너지 전환을 위한 노력에 더욱 박차를 가하고 있습니다. 관련 경험이 풍부한 유럽 각국이나 캐나다 사례 등을 연구하고 당사자들의 목소리를 반영하여 지역경제나 일자리에 가해질 피해를 최소화하면서 청정에너지 중심의 산업구조로 전환해 나가는 것을 목표로 하고 있습니다. 또한 도내 신재생에너지 발전량을 현재 7.4%에서 2040년까지 40% 이상으로 향상시켜 나가고자 합니다. 석탄 발전의 비중은 현재 74.5%에서 2040년에는 19.3%로 낮춰 나가겠습니다. 이를 위해 2026년까지 노후한 석탄 화력 발전소 14기를 먼저 폐쇄하고 2050년에는 석탄 화력 발전소 30기를 모두 폐쇄할 계획입니다. 하지만 정의로운 에너지 전환에는 많은 자금과 획기적인 발상이 필요합니다. 충청남도는 한국 정부가 추진하고 있는 그린 뉴딜 예산의 10%를 정의로운 에너지 전환을 위한 기금 조성에 사용해 줄 것을 건의하였습니다. 또 청정에너지가 확산되는데 걸림돌이었던 각 지방정부마다 다른 입주 규제를 전국적으로 통일해 나가는 방향으로 규제 개선을 중앙정부에 권유했습니다. 아울러 충청남도는 기후금융공시제도의 도입을 제안하였습니다. 금융기관이 어떤 에너지에 투자하는지 분야별 투자 정보를 공개해서 국민 누구나 알수 있고 기후위가 가져올 경제 리스크에 
보다 발빠르게 대응할 수 있도록 하는 제도를 마련하는 것입니다. 지난해 충청남도는 도금교를 운영하는 금융기관 지정 시 금융기관의 탈석탄 선언 참여 여부 및 석탄 발전 투자 실적, 친환경 에너지 투자 실적 등을 반영하는 평가 지표를 만들어 대한민국에서 가장 먼저 시행했습니다. 우리 도는 이런 사례를 전국적으로 확산하고자 전국의 지자체와 교육청에 함께하자는 제안을 하였고 이에 여러 기관들이 호응해 주셔서 지난 9월 8일 전국 56개 기관이 함께 동참하는 가운데 전국 탈석탄 금고 선언식을 개최한 바 있습니다. 함께하는 기관의 연간 재정 규모는 148조 8천억 원에 달합니다. 이를 통해 탈석탄 금고 참여가 더 확대되면서 금융기관의 투자 방향을 석탄에서 청정 에너지로 바꿀 수 있다고 확신합니다. 존경하는 내기민 여러분, 올여름 한국, 중국, 일본 등 동아시아는 이례 없는 폭우로 인한 홍수 피해를 입었습니다. 또한 시베리아는 이례적인 고온 현상이 지속됐으며 미국과 호주는 치약의 산풀 피해를 입었습니다. 지금은 우리 몸과 같이 유한하며 충격에 치약하다는 증거입니다. 산업화의 과정에서 배출된 온실가스로 인해 지구는 열사병에 걸려 있고 인류는 지금까지 겪지 못한 기상이변과 기후위기에 내몰리고 있습니다. 지난 IPCC 1.5도시 특별보고서에서도 언급했듯이 이젠 우리에게 0.5도시밖에 남지 않았고 더 이상 낭비할 시간이 없습니다. 우리 세대만 누리는 번영과 성장에 몰두한다면 모두가 불행해지게 됩니다. 전 인류의 관점에서 앞으로 미래 세대를 생각하고 청정한 지구를 만들기 위해 모든 에너지를 쏟을 때입니다. 저와 충청남도가 탈석탄과 청정에너지 전환을 위한 노력을 함께 하겠습니다. 경청해 주셔서 감사합니다. 감사합니다. EDP is a global leader in the energy sector, one of the world's very largest energy producers, and a brand new member of the PPCA. Welcome, Mr. DaCosta. The floor is yours. I believe you are muted, if you could unmute. Thank you very much um, for the invitation to be here. It's a pleasure to join this alliance, Powering Past Coal Alliance. And I would like to, to spend a few minutes explaining why we joined the alliance, who we are, and um, to let you know EDP is a um, Portuguese headquarter based company. It's an integrated utility. It's a public listed company in Euronext. It operates in 19 countries. It serves uh, more than 10 million clients. And uh, it's nowadays the fourth largest wind operator worldwide. We also are investing a lot in offshore wind, and we are doing that in partnerships with other, with other companies. We have a total capacity installed of uh, 26.5 gigawatts, which means that in the last 15 years, we doubled the, the capacity installed. And we also decrease the share of coal in our portfolio, generation portfolio. Uh, in 2005, coal represented 58% of our portfolio. Nowadays, it represents 16% and it will change very fast as I will have the chance to explain you a little bit later. Uh, regarding our commitments uh, towards sustainability, we defined long time ago our strategy in terms of a sustainability strategy. We are fully aligned with ESG principles and uh, we, uh, we announced public commitments, for example, with the UN Global Compact in 2003. Uh, more recently, we subscribed, um, we declared that we are aligned with nine of the 17 
SDG Sustainable Development Goals of the United Nations. We signed last year the pledge for um, 1.5 degrees Celsius, the business ambition that was signed by 87 uh, companies uh, uh, in New York uh, last year. Uh, we are all also aligned with the, the science-based targets initiative. So we report according to all those best practices in terms of global reporting initiative and the, the task force of climate and financial disclosure. So we are fully committed with the, this roadmap to sustainability. And in terms of coal, what does it mean? It means that we announced our sustainability targets um, that by 2050, we want to be carbon neutral. Uh, and this means that uh, by 2030, we are going to have 90% of our generation coming from renewables uh, sources. And also at that time, we will have a 90% reduction of CO2 emissions regarding 2005 uh, basis. And we also announced that we are going to close all of our uh, coal power plants. Uh, we have already uh, declared in, in more detail what uh, this means. This means that in Portugal, we have a, an important coal power plant of uh, more than 1000 megawatts of uh, power that will be closed next year. So we are anticipating two years regarding the objectives of the Portuguese government. In Spain, we have three coal power plants. That one of them will be closed next year. The second one will be transformed in a, a gas uh, central, um, uh, a gas uh, power plant, no longer coal. And the third one will be kept in reserve and will be decommissioned before 2030. And in Brazil, the last one that we have, will also uh, close it down before 2030. So by 2030, we'll have no coal power plants in our fleet. Uh, and at the same time, we announced that uh, we are investing more and more in renewable energy. Uh, last year, we announced, uh, we, we did a strategic update announcing to the markets, to the investors, that uh, the next four years, so until 2022, we are investing 12 billion euros 75% uh, of those 12 billion, so it means 9 billion euros will be investments in wind and solar, wind both onshore and offshore, and uh, the remaining 25% will be in networks and client solutions. So we are fully committed, not only in our strategic guidelines, but also in our targets with this roadmap to uh, being a carbon free uh, company. Um, and as a conclusion, I would say that uh, retiring from coal, so phasing out coal, it's uh, something that we have decided not only for economic reasons, because the incentives and the profits are no longer there with the tax system, uh, with the CO2 uh, burden, uh, so it's no longer profitable. That's an objective reason, but more than that, it's because we strongly believe that we are contributing to the energy transition and uh, in order to achieve the climate goals that we are committed to. And uh, finally, uh, the reason for investing in renewables is because we really believe that this is the way to go. Uh, it means uh, business uh, that makes profits with a purpose. So purpose and profit, that's our really our, our, our aim. And uh, we believe that we are creating a positive footprint for the next generations. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Mr. DaCosta. I'd now like to invite Julian Leslie, the head of networks electricity system operator at the Nat uh, National Grid to our virtual stage. National Grid joined PPCA in 2019 with the goal of developing zero carbon electricity system by 2025. Julian Leslie, the floor is yours. Great, thank you very much. And it's great to be here and thank you for the invitation. Um, it's great to use the Power and Pascal initiative to, um, <clears throat> to sort of share our experiences here in GB and how we've managed to really operate the network now. We've had over 70 days without cold, our longest period. But more importantly, as a system operator in Great Britain, 
we no longer rely on the services from coal in order to operate the grid system. So the only reason why coal gets uh, uh, synchronized in, in Great Britain now is to meet the demand of the nation, uh, which is coming less and less. So our role as national grid system operator is our role to facilitate the connection of renewables and to operate the grid system with whatever generation mix is available on the day. However, as we're moving forward, more and more renewables coming onto the system and the maximum amount of renewables or low carbon generation we've run is 88% of low carbon, uh, which was during the summer. So we got some great experience now as to how to operate a grid system without coal and with very high levels of penetration of renewable. But we wanted to go one step further. We wanted to make sure that by 2025, that when the market conditions are such that the demand is low and the solar and wind output is high, that we will be able to operate the grid system at zero carbon. So that means we have to have the right tools and products on the system in order to operate the grid system safely and securely. This is a real challenge and we believe it's one of the world leading ESOs, electricity system operators in the world, just because of the pace of the change. Uh, it's really just come on over the last five years and we've been able to operate the system in this way. There's a lot more distributed generation on our system so we don't have that direct um, centralized control or visibility of that generation but also recognizing the importance of demand and how the consumption of electricity is becoming a very important balancing tool in how we think about how the energy will be utilized in the future. And we're gonna be one of the first large countries to transition from a very fossil fuel based energy system, electricity system, to one which is clean and zero carbon. So how have we got here? We've had very strong leadership from the from the GB UK government and really in 2010 setting a target that all 15% of all electricity had to be renewable by 2020 was really the beginning of the real transformation we've seen here in Great Britain. Alongside that we had to accelerate the connection of renewables in order to meet that target. So we introduced new policies and new strategies for creating the connections to the grid system and been able to operate the system safely and securely whilst really uh, accelerating the connection of renewable generation. So in 10 years, we have connected roughly 12 gigawatts of wind and in a region of 10 gigawatts of onshore, oh, sorry, 12 gigawatts of offshore wind and around 10 gigawatts of onshore wind. Alongside that, we've also seen a real big uptake in solar panels and that we now have around 10 gigawatts of solar on the system also. So huge percentages of the national demand are now provided by renewable energy. However, as a system operator, we can't just run a system on purely renewable energy. We need other services and products that we've never had to think about before because conventional power plants provide these services, such as frequency response, inertia, uh, and grid stability. So these technical services were just byproducts of coal and gas-fired power plants. But they obviously rely on fossil fuels to drive them. So we led the way this year by setting out a tender which looks for zero megawatt, zero carbon solutions to these technical problems. And we were pleased to announce in January of this year, the first ever in the world, a market tender for inertia. And one of the solutions to that was to repurpose an old coal-fired power station so that it now consumes a little bit of energy, electricity off the system that we get the services, the, the inertia, the frequency response that we used to get without burning coal. As we move forward over the next three to four years, we need to continue to innovate. We need to continue to go to the market, to look for the innovation as to how we provide these grid services. So products like flywheels and other smart power electronics are gonna help us meet this, this challenge. Obviously in doing this, we are learning a lot and we're able to share our experience through forums like this, but also through the international forums, something called Go15, which is the top 19 transmission system operators in the world. This summer has been a real interesting time for us with the impact of COVID-19, and it's a real glimmer of the future. Our demand was roughly 20% below where it would have been normally, um, which gave us a real insight to look at what 2025 would really um, feel like. And it really gave us confidence that the actions and the opportunities that we're exploring really are going in the right direction and that our ambition of operating the system at zero carbon in 2025 
is really achievable. So we've now gone, if you think about it, in 2012, 40% of all of our electricity in the UK came from, from coal. In 2016, that was down to less than 10%. And this year so far, we have used less than 2% of coal to supply our electricity needs. And it's through our planning, our forward view of the system, working with UK government, setting new policies and strategies to allow the acceleration of the deployment of renewable energy that has got us into this position. But it really does take a whole system view as to think about how you think of an energy network and an electricity network and how you can find new and innovative ways in order to drive, um, drive down costs for consumers but maintain the reliability and safe operation of the grid system. Thank you all for your time. That's all I wanted to say. Thank you so much, Mr. Leslie. I appreciate you sharing that, that experience. We're going to transition now to the second part of today's event. Um, and I'd like to welcome again, Governor Yang Sung Jo, the governor of the South Chungcheong province, alongside Ambassador Christensen, who is Denmark's climate ambassador. Dr. Carl Young, the Managing Director of the Korea Sustainability Forum, and Antonio Castro, the Risk and Sustainability Corporate Director at EDP to share their insights on how governments and companies can make this transition and best support the fast track to clean energy and our efforts to phase out coal. So I'm going to turn first uh, to Ambassador uh, Christensen of Denmark. Um, Denmark is a global leader, of course, in the green energy transition and co-leads the UN energy transition track um, to help advance sustainable energy. So I'm wondering if we could get your views on how countries that are already transitioning um, or have transitioned, um, how can they help drive the global coal phase out? Thank you, Anton. Thank you for, uh, for helping moderate this so effectively. Uh, uh, Denmark, as a co-host of the Energy Transition Track with Ethiopia, is very happy to have this webinar as part of the series uh, of, of follow-up events to the SG Summit last year. And and really, I, I think that there are there are a number of ways where we, who are fast uh, moving along this transition, can can support others. Uh, I think the UK. Uh, a colleague who just spoke um, from UK's national perspective uh, gave a number of indications as to lessons learned that could also be applied in, in other countries. And in Denmark, uh, we have been working for a long time on our uh, wind. Uh, you can see the windmill behind me. Um, uh, 30 years ago, we, we started constructing the first offshore wind farm, which we're actually in the process of decommissioning now. But only now, 30 years later, has offshore wind gone through the valley of death and is now actually becoming cost competitive in the global market and is really one of the, the cheapest sources of energy now. Um, that also means that we've spent the COVID crisis so under lockdown uh, passing our um, new climate bill in Parliament. And that's our recovery plan, if you want. We've combined uh, uh, the future with the current situation. 70% uh, emissions reductions by 2030. Uh, and uh, as part of that, it's the full decarbonization of the Danish uh, energy system. We have a couple of coal power plants left and they will be decommissioned within the next few years. And then we will be fully relying on mostly wind and some solar and biomass. Um, we, uh, we have started an elaborate uh, collaboration program through our Danish energy agency, where we work with uh, 11 of the um, fastest emerging economies uh, on energy transition, where we have deployed uh, energy experts to work uh, uh, and, and uh, share our knowledge. Uh, we were very happy with the collaboration with Korea uh, and, and happy to hear the very bold uh, announcement from the governor. Um, we have a close partnership uh, with a number of Asian, other Asian countries and uh, we think in a way, sharing our knowledge on how to integrate uh, large-scale wind into the grid, um, we, we can help others move much faster along this valley of death of, of, new, of new technology. In Denmark today, we have um, 
6% of all private jobs in uh, the green uh, sector. Um, revenues have increased by more than 30% over the last few years. And uh, green energy jobs, uh, or green energy is now 15% of our, of our exports. Um, and, and we really think we can help other countries get to that level of, of excellence by a combination of, of climate diplomacy, technical cooperation, uh, export of, of technology. And uh, we will now also, through our development cooperation in Africa, uh, have a, a, a very sharp focus on uh, energy access through clean technology and clean energy. And, and I think, Anta, there, there, are, there are many ways that, that we can work uh, and, and also thereby living up to our um, Paris commitments on uh, capacity building and knowledge sharing and, and financing by sharing this technology and sharing this knowledge. So thanks. Thank you for sharing that. And, and before I turn to our other panelists, I'll just ask a, a brief follow up, which is what, what are you asking um, of countries and, and companies that have yet to make the transition away from coal? Well, I, I mean, one thing that we're having as part of our conversation is really to be bold in their ambition, uh, uh, ratchet up their NDCs, but, but don't do it blindly. Do it based on a scientific approach and the deep knowledge of your of your energy system. Uh, try to lay out a path of uh, of um, phasing out coal that is based on the cost competitiveness of other sources of of energy that will actually benefit both your economy consumers, jobs, and health, um, uh, have short-term targets, a long-term target, uh, and, uh, and really look at the economics of it. Because in, I think um, the, the, the uh, uh, early um, retirement report that uh, Mountain Institute and PPCA just put out showed that for 39% of the current um, coal installations, uh, they are already uh, less cost effective than the alternatives and within uh, two years it'll be 60 percent and within the next five years it will be all coal power plants that will be that will be outcompeted by by the alternatives so basically um, any new investments in coal will be investments in stranded assets but really work on the economics of the investment and and look at the opportunities for doing something else that's very interesting. Thank you for those those remarks. Um, I'll just add on top of, of your comment about the, the recent study that PPCA and Rocky Mountain Institute did. Um, we've also seen studies from Bloomberg New Energy Finance on the um, clean energy investment and jobs potential of the transition uh, away from coal, which is, which is very significant as well and, and worth reviewing. I, I want to um, yeah, can just... I, can I just add one thing, Antha? Yeah. Which is that in Denmark, we also have the experience of our own national utility, which used to be called Dong Energy. Ten years ago, they were a coal utility with coal power plants all over the country. They have today, ten years later, shedded all their coal power plants and are now not only Denmark's large operator of wind farms, but actually the world's largest operator of wind farm and they have become a global green utility with wind farm installations uh, either uh, constructed or underway anywhere from uh, from the US East Coast to Australia to Taiwan to uh, uh, places around the world and I think for energy companies that are looking towards the uh, end of oil the end of the fossil era as BP called it on Monday um, investments into green energy and, and the green solutions is really the way forward if they don't want to go totally out of business. Thanks. That's a great story. Thank you. Thank you for sharing that. A, a quick logistical um, reminder for those uh, uh, in need of translation services from English to Korean and Korean to English, there is a language uh, interpretation or translation button on the right side of your screen. You can click that, choose the language channel that you want, and then you do have to click done uh, in order to, to enable that. Um, I'd like to turn now um, back to Governor Yang uh, from the South Chungcheong province in South Korea. Governor, you're a critical example of the importance of subnational action uh, in this transition uh, and the power of that action uh, to help help advance the, the clean energy 
um, economy. So a question for you is how can subnational governments encourage national governments um, to implement the new policies and legislation that will be necessary to move towards a low carbon economy? Over to you, Governor Young. Yeah,中南部地方的杨生军입니다。大家好，一人说中央的话，从国际的话，从国际的话，从国际的话，从国际的话，从国际的话，从国际的话，从国际的话，从国际的话，从国际的话，从国际的话，从国际的话，从国际
2050년까지는 충청남도 내에서 화력발전소를 제로할 수 있도록 시민단체와 연계해서 강력하게 추진하겠다는 말씀을 드립니다. 감사합니다. I'd like to turn to Dr. Carl Young, who's the managing director of the Korea Sustainability Forum. Um, and uh, again, I'll just make a note about translation. There is a language interpretation button. You can choose your channel and you need to push done. Um, so Dr. Young, your organization works to promote the practices of socially responsible investment in Korea. Um, so I'd like to ask you, what actions can organizations take to encourage national governments to introduce new policies and legislation that are necessary to move toward a low carbon economy? Thank you, Dr. Young. Ah, yeah, Yang Chunsung입니다. 우선 그 이런 그 충정에너지로 전환을 가속화하자는 PPCA의 행사에 참여하게 돼서 큰 영광으로 생각합니다. 저희 한국 사회적인 필요 포럼은 2007년 4월 지속가능 금융의 발전을 도모하기 위해서 만들어진 비영리 기관입니다. 2008년부터 CDP 활동을 지원해 오고 있고 2018년부터는 한국 금융 기관의 탈석탄 선언을 주도하는 일을 맡고 있습니다. 저한테 질문하신 것의 내용을 보면 이제 중앙 정부가 저탄소 경제를 향한 어떤 정책 변화를 가져오는 행동이 무엇일까 이렇게 말씀을 드렸는데요. 한국적인 상황에서 저는 그 입법부의 역할을 중시하고 있습니다. 왜냐하면 한국 행정부, 중앙정부는 임기가 그 5년이기 때문에 그 5년마다 정권이 바뀌었을 때 어떻게 될지 모른다는 이런 그 인식들이 좀 있어요. 그래서 행정부가 그걸 적어도 중앙정부, 지방정부는 좀 다르게 봅니다만은 중앙정부 경우에는 그 지속적이고 장기적인 정책을 세우는 게좀 문제가 있다는 생각을 해서 주로 입법부를 설득하는 작업을 많이 해왔습니다. 그래서 2015년부터 국민연금법, 또 정부조달법, 산업발전법 이런 등의 법에 환경, 사회, 지배구조 같은 ESG를 고려 해서 운영을 하도록 자산 자금을 운영하도록 하는 그런 규정을 도입하도록 법을 바꿨고 또 전기사업법을 개정해서 어, 민간이 재생에너지를 살수 있게 하여 어, 리뉴얼 에너지 원환들에도 아리백 이니셔티브에 국내 기업들이 참여할 수 있는 길을 열었습니다. 이처럼 입법부를 설득하는 걸 통해서 저희들은 중앙정부 정책의 변화가 좀 이루어질 수 있다 이런 생각을 하고 있고요. 최근에는 에, 역시 그, 그 국회와 에, 국회와 이게 합의 국회와 이 의견을 나눠서 석탄 화력 투자 백서를 발간하는 에, 작업을 이제 최근에는 하고 있습니다. Yeah. 또 다른 질문 주십시오. Um, well, that, that's a uh, helpful context. And I think we've heard a couple of times the need for um, better information um, for investors to make uh, decisions about companies and their, their um, climate risk. Uh, I wonder if you can say a few words more about how um, organizations can help drive the um, transition to a low carbon economy. 제가 제대로 이해를 했는지는 모르겠습니다만 어, 저희들이 하는 노력에 대해서 조금 말씀을 드릴게요. 저희들은 에, 아까 금방 말씀드린 대로 어, 입법부를 통해서 에, 법률 지원 내지는 법률, 에, 법률 개정 내지는 재정을 통해서 신재생에너지가 더 어, 촉진되게 하고 또이 국회 내에 사회책임 투자 포럼이나 또는 뭐 CSR 포럼 
또 반부패 포럼 이런 걸 조직해서 의원들끼리 이런 그이 새로운 경제에 대한 새로운 사회에 대한 토론을 하도록 이게 서포트하는 역할을 하고 있고요. 두 번째는 어, 지방자치단체 또는 어, 지방교육청과 어, 이렇게 커, 어, 만, 만나서 금방 그 양승조 지사님이 하시듯이 자신들 자금을 관리하는 근거를 선정할 때 석탄 화력을 지원하는 금융기관을 배제하도록 그렇게 요구하는 작업을 하고 있습니다. 현재 한국지방자치단체의 총 자산 규모는 약 3,200억 달러고 교육청의 전체 자산 규모는 631억 달러에 달하고 있습니다. 합쳐서 3,831억 달러인데 지난 9월 8일 충청남도 양승조 지사님 주도로 만들어진 2020 탈석탄 기후위기 대응 국제 컨퍼런스에서 탈석탄 금고 선언에 참여한 지자체와 교육청이 56개국 그들의 자산 규모가 1,251억 달러입니다. 어, 상당히 큰 성과죠. 이런 추세는 앞으로 더욱더 확산들이라고 저는 믿고 있습니다. 이 자리를 빌어서 우리 양승조 지사님의 리더십에 깊은 경의를 표합니다. 또 저희들이 세 번째로 하는 일은 주요 금, 금융기관들을 직접 설득하는 일입니다. 그래서 금융기관의 이 저, 주요 이, 이 임원들을 만나서 탈석탄 선언에 동참하도록 권유를 하고 있습니다. 어, 2018년 저희들이 그런 탈석탄 석탄 발전 투자 배제 운동을 주도하면서 작년 말까지 자산 규모 937억 달러에 달하는 다섯 개 기관이 탈석탄 선언에 참여를 했습니다. 그리고 금년에도 열다섯 개 금융기관을 목표로 하여서 탈석탄 선언에 참여하도록 설득하는 작업을 하고 있습니다. 아마 금년 11월쯤이면은 그에 대한 가시적 성과가 좀 나오지 않겠나 이렇게 기대를 하고 있고요. 또 한국 최대 연기금인 국민연금으로 하여금 TCFD를 수용하고 CDP에 적극 참여하도록 이런 설득 작업도 지속하고 있습니다. 이것들이 최근에 저희들이 하고 있는 역할들이고 활동 내 내용들입니다. Thank you so much for those uh, comments, Dr. Yang. Those are, those are very helpful. Um, and as we move into the panel, if we have time, I, I'd welcome uh, Ambassador Christensen to come back in on the question of how um, these types of commitments and momentum can be most effectively mobilized in advance of, of, the, next, um, of the next COP. But, but before we go into to any discussion that we may have time for, I, I want to invite um, some comments from our final uh, panelist, Antonio Castro, the Risk and Sustainability Corporate Director at EDP. Um, and Mr. Castro, your company is phasing out coal, um, recently announcing the closure of coal plants in Portugal and Spain, as we've heard. Um, and EDP is really um, working to take a lead role. So I wonder if you could speak to what are the top two or three things that a utility needs to do um, or address with respect to coal power transition. Okay, thank you. First of all, thank you very much for the invitation. It's a pleasure to be here. Let me tell you a little bit about what we are doing. EDP has, I would say 10 years ago, changed completely strategy and decided to only promote, if you want, uh, right. green, okay. green energy. If I can interrupt briefly, yeah, I think yeah, we're sure. translating on the English um, channel. So if we could fix um, translation channels. Sorry, do you, mind, do you mind briefly testing here? Okay, are you hearing now? Um, well, can I start now or? I think we can hear you, yes. All right, fine, Thank thanks. You. Thanks. As I was telling you, EDP, uh, so it's a Portuguese utility. As you've mentioned, we are the commissioning coal in Iberia. Um, this strategy, I would say, has started 10 years ago when we had decided to change completely our port generation portfolio. We, we decided just to invest in clean energy, and that's what we have been doing in the last 10 years. Uh, let me tell you that our goal is to reduce something like 90% of total emissions that we generate up to 2030. 
starting from 2015. So it's a very, very ambitious goal. We believe we can do it. We, we, we believe we can do it. Um, what are the Q, the Q, if you want, the most important issues that, that we face at this time? I wouldn't say just EDP, but all, 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 all the companies. First of all, uh, I think we have to raise the ambition of, 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 of the CO2 the decrease that you need. We have, I think, sufficient studies already uh, that demonstrate that climate change, climate change is a real risk for humanity and for, 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 for everyone, I would say. Uh, so the first thing is to raise ambition. It's the second thing that I think we have to do is we, we have to spread out, if you want, the impact of, of CO2 in, into the economy. At this stage, only a few sectors of the economy feel what could be the price of uh, generating CO2. Uh, so it's important that everyone, any consumer that buys any type of product can see and can feel in there what's the impact of consuming, if you want, CO2. So CO2 price should be spread out through the, through, throughout the economy. The third one, which is connected with this, it's if you want the price of CO2. It's, it, it's important if, 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 if there is something that we believe we want to uh, reduce, we have to give a true value to it. And uh, what we are seeing is that the CO2 prices are rising a little bit. I think they are at the point that the change in the merit order between coal and CCGT is, uh, they exist already, and that's what we are seeing the decommissioning of coal now. But I think it's not sufficient for the next steps that we need, and if you want to raise ambition. So, having a very clear CO2 price uh, with transparent rules spread out through all the economy, throughout, through all the sectors, I think it's, it's, it's very, very important. In, our, in EDP, as, as I was saying at the beginning, uh, we at this stage only invest, if you want, our capex, and we are doing all over the world, I would say, uh, renewables. Uh, it's very important for us uh, to have, um, and you, I think everybody knows now, that renewables today, solar and wind, are the most competitive ways to generate electricity today. And so it's not, a, no one is asking for grants or sub from su subsidies at this stage. What I think we need is, is a clear regime that gives confidence to investors to invest in many parts of the world. And I, I, I think in many uh, undeveloped countries that need a lot of investment in renewables, we need to create conditions to attract, if you want, investors to go there. So that, that's very helpful. Let me, let me ask you a follow-up. Um, what kind of support um, or collaboration then do you need from national governments um, or, or some of the sub-national um, actors, uh, as we're describing here. I give you an example. For instance, in in in, in some countries like my own, uh, government have made have made some auctions. So it's a competitive, it's a, a, comp a competitive way to bring, if you want, renewables to 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 um, to the electricity sector. So it's it's not subsidies. It's 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 an auction. Everyone can bid for. And uh, what we have is a 10 years contract, a 10 year contract or a contract for difference or a, or a fixed price. The bidders will say, will will we'll give their bid and, and, and the conditions they want. And what we have seen is a significant decrease in prices, a very, very significant decrease in prices. So this way of promoting auctions that give a comfortable, a comfort if you want to investors that they are going to have uh, to receive, if you want, uh, a certain price for the electricity for the next 10 or 15 years, I think it's the best way at the same time to promote comp uh, uh, competition. The second one to, to introduce, if you want, or to increase the penetration of the rules that every, everyone needs at this stage. Thank you so much. Um, I'd like to turn back to uh, Ambassador Christensen to see if you'd like to, to come back in either on the question of, you know, m mobilizing um, these voices uh, over the next year to, to 18 months, um, or in reaction to, to any of the other comments of the other panelists. Well, um, Antha, I, I, I thought I'd take you up on the first one. Uh, 
the commitment mobilization uh, thrust as we move towards Glasgow. And I think there are, there are many interesting things going on. Uh, let, let me mention a few and a few mechanisms. And I, I think uh, Antonio just also mentioned the question of carbon, carbon pricing, uh, uh, taxation in Europe. We have the ETS scheme that is, that is pushing companies and that is being revised now as part of the Green Deal. Uh, was announced by, by Commission President von der Leyen yesterday. There's also in Europe the discussion of a carbon border adjustment tax, which basically would be a, a tax on uh, CO2 con content of products coming into, into Europe. So uh, uh, consumer goods, say, produced in Korea with uh, the use of, of coal power would be labeled as uh, having such and such CO2 content. And consumers would then be ready or able to um, to choose between a, a, a high CO2 content product and a low or zero content product. Uh, we know that that for um, uh, the largest shipping company in the world, Maersk, uh, they have announced a, a zero net emissions target for 2050, and that's because they are the company that ship the consumer products say Nike shoes or products from, for Walmart or Ikea. And these companies have asked of Maersk to guarantee that, uh, that there will be uh, zero emissions from the transport of their goods. Uh, hence, uh, that is driving Maersk to, to decarbonize their, um, their value chain. Uh, and uh, so as these companies uh, decarbonize their supply chains, uh, transport companies will follow suit. Um, so, so that's, that's one way. Uh, another way that many companies are working on, uh, either in coalitions or on their own, is to uh, adopt so-called science-based targets, where they set targets for how to get to zero by 2050. And uh, in addition, there are uh, associations of investors that uh, also have set themselves a getting to zero target. We know that there is a very large group of institutional investors with uh, I think now $8 trillion on the management that have uh, pledged to only invest in, in zero emission assets. Uh, just to give a few examples, I, I think uh, normal people can also as consumers, uh, uh, I mean, put their money with where their interests are and, and as voters. And the shift we have seen in my country uh, was due to an election last year where the young people all voted for the going green and that led to a landslide in Danish politics, the same thing in Europe. The reason why Commission President von der Leyen yesterday announced a, a, a minimum of 55% reduction in 2030 is because European uh, voters voted green parties into European Parliament and into European politics and that's the mandate they have. Um, so so uh, people actually also have the possibility of, of moving politics quite fast if they, if they want to do so. Thanks, Anta. That's an important an important comment and uh, and well taken. Where we sit uh, here in the United States, just 50, 50 days out from our our next elections, um, and seeing quite a lot of both action and potential from subnational actors in reducing emissions, um, but also so much more that we that we can and need to do um, in order to, in order to hit our, our targets of, of full decarbonization by 2050. Um, Antonio Castro, I see you coming back on, on video with us. I wonder if you want to make a, a final remark before we turn to our, our closing remarks and, and conclude this panel. Yeah, just one, just one final remark. I think I've, this, I've talked already about the ambition, about the CO2 price, about the, the promotion of renewables. Uh, I think what is missing, just of what I wanted to 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 to, to share with you, is uh, is we can't leave people behind. So we are the commissioning now coal, and uh, I think who, the companies with governments, I think we have to make an effort that we we don't leave those people behind. So we have to find ways that uh, uh, that these people can 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 work if you want in the new green economy. Uh, and this is a challenge. At PDP, I can tell you that we are already, um, already, if you want, promoting, promoting uh, ways where we can change 
uh, and use in, in, in different ways our employees that, that, that work in the cool pop plants. They will have to work on other areas and we are preparing that. So an important message is we are changing, we are removing coal, but we shouldn't leave people behind. And this is not just the people that work in the power plants, but also in, 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 in the coal in, in the coal mines. So the, the, we have to prepare ourselves and, and we have to, to, to help if you want. And this is something that governments have a, a, a word, an important way to, to, to say about it. And companies, of course, they can help as they can. Very important point about the livelihoods uh, transition. Um, thank you. Thank you for making that point. So um, that concludes our panel. I'd like to thank each of the panelists for their very thoughtful comments. Um, before we close the event today, we do have uh, remarks from, from two final speakers. So I would like to turn it back uh, to Climate Ambassador Christensen as the UN co-lead with Ethiopia of the Energy Transitions Initiative to say a few final words in closing and then and then we'll have one more speaker and wrap up. Climate Ambassador Christensen. Thank you, Ante. I, I think I'm monopolizing the speaking time here, but let me tr let me be very brief. But just start out by echoing the final words of, of um, the gentleman from Portugal that as we move into the the um, uh, the end phase of coal globally, it is very important to ensure that this transition becomes just and one that takes into question the the equity and fairness for those involved in the extractive sector. Um, we cannot expect others to engage and commit if we do not address the question of social intervention, um, uh, jobs, livelihoods, uh, uh, the workers' uh, plights. Um, that, that goes for uh, coal miners in, in uh, Western countries and in developed countries like uh, all over. And I think, uh, if we really want to push on, on getting the 2,000 or so coal power plants that are active around the world closed, uh, we have to be mindful also of the social dimension in, in doing so. Um, with that, I want to uh, thank everyone for joining this, uh, this um, uh, session and especially the newcomers to the PPCA. Uh, your interventions in this uh, panel, including from Peru and Korea, have really been very much welcome, a very impressive uh, uh, trajectory that you are, have pledged here, uh, especially in a time of uh, an economic crisis of a global scale, a pandemic. Um, this shows the political will to move, uh, uh, but also uh, I think we have an acute need for progress on the agenda of coal phase out. So, so your sign here today uh, of joining this group is really encouraging. Um, and we can only hope that we will uh, attract more to this platform by the time of Glasgow so that it really can become a, a, a movement and an avalanche uh, um, uh, so that we can use this time of crisis actually to rethink and redirect economic decisions in a sustainable fashion. Um, and and uh, you have really shown the way here today with this expansion of the PPCA family. Also, uh, by bringing subnational, uh, new subnational actors in, I think we're showing uh, a way forward uh, that can also help national governments in, in um, getting to the hard decision of phasing out coal. And uh, thus, um, we look forward to seeing you all in person in Glasgow um, and hope that we can work systematically and comprehensively together to promote the clean offer through carefully designed strategies and dialogues with all our partners. So thank you, Antha, and thank you also to Canada and, uh, and the UK for co-hosting this with us. Thanks. Thank you so much, Ambassador. Um, and I'd now like to give the floor to Minister Kwasi Kwarteng, who is the UK Minister for Business Energy and Clean Growth. Um, and a co-chair of the Powering Past Coal Alliance. Um, the UK has been instrumental to help raise the global ambition on coal phase out. So Minister, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you very much. I'd like to thank all attendees for their participation today. It's been a really interesting uh, set of conversations that we've had. Uh, special thanks to Minister Wilkinson and uh, his team in Canada for their role 
in organizing this event. I'd also like to thank uh, Climate Ambassador Thomas Christensen and his team uh, from Denmark uh, for hosting uh, the event. Accelerating coal phase out uh, globally is extremely important so that we can meet our Paris goals and deliver a green and resilient recovery from COVID-19. The PPCA stands ready to support governments in shaping and implementing green recovery plans to achieve sustainable prosperity across the world, fueled by clean electricity in place of coal. In the UK, we are accelerating our clean energy transition, moving forward the coal phase out date uh, from 2025 to 2024. We've just uh, experienced over two months here in the UK of completely free uh, coal uh, power uh, generation. As the world emerges uh, from the impacts of the pandemic, we now have an opportunity to put the global energy sector on a clean, low carbon trajectory. And this is exactly what the PPCA is aiming to help uh, countries across the world uh, to do. It's really heartening to see such a range of participants striving uh, to move towards clean energy. It shows, I think, that the PPCA is engaging with the international energy community, including countries which are more uh, coal intensive, uh, so that they can expand the range of accessible uh, clean energy options. It is with great pleasure uh, that we welcome uh, Peru, our first member in Latin America, into the alliance. Alongside uh, Peru, we have also welcomed two new South Korean members. Seoul and Gongji uh, province uh, have been welcomed into the alliance and they join uh, existing member South Chungcheong province. It's all very exciting and we look forward uh, to further leadership from them in the region to drive uh, the inevitable now uh, transition from coal. These new members add to an ever stronger uh, global PPCA family. And I'm pleased to say there are now well over 100 members and the PPCA continues uh, to grow at pace, showing, I think, the impact we are already having in accelerating the shift from coal to clean energy. We must uh, ensure that every country considering new coal plants can access, have access to a clean power investment and assistance offer, uh, which is more attractive. I look forward uh, to uh, seeing many uh, members, perhaps all of you uh, at COP26 itself. But in the meantime, uh, I think it's particularly interesting uh, to see the actions and the economic reforms that PPCA members and partners are taking to develop uh, over the next few months and particularly in the run-up to COP26. As incoming uh, COP presidents uh, working very closely with our Canadian PPCA co-leads, we invite you all, uh, countries, expert organizations, businesses, investors, as well as uh, civil society itself, uh, we invite you all to work with us uh, to make our vision of a coal-free future a reality. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Minister. We would like to thank the Danish UN mission and the Ethiopian UN mission as co-leads of the energy transition track of the Climate Action Summit for hosting this event and for their webinar series over the last two weeks. And this brings us to the conclusion of today's event. Um, looking ahead, we can see a coal-free future on our horizon. Um, and we've witnessed really incredible progress from national governments, from subnational leaders, from businesses, as we've heard here today, who are all showing incredible commitment and leadership in advancing a clean energy economy. And all of us know that recovery efforts, our economic recovery efforts, will go hand in hand with bold climate action. 
um, that as one of our uh, speakers mentioned, that now is the opportunity to build back better. Um, and that the leaders here today will play a critical role in achieving an even faster transition away from coal towards a clean energy future. Thank you again for joining us today. Stay safe and be well. Thank you.